My name is Edward T. Smith. I was born in Fresno, California, October 1930. My dad was a deputy sheriff, and my mom, she was a bookkeeper for the linen supply house. And uh, we lived on the ranch and milked a lot of cows. And uh, when I thought I was too smart, I left that and joined the Army. <laughs> you thought that you're smart. That's right. Nobody so you could teach me nothing. I knew it all. You enlisted Army. I enlisted in the Army in January 1948. Took my basic training in Fort Ord, California. It was went to first assignment was Camp Cook, California, which was a disciplinary barracks down south. And from there, I was only there six, seven months, and then they closed out the the personnel, and I moved to Fort Lewis, Washington. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there until I was shipped out to Korea for the war. No, where it was at, or one single thing. And on the way over, we just thought we was going to Japan. We didn't know where we was going. When I got off the boat, we said, "Where are we at?" And they said, "You're in Busan." I said, "Where the hell is Busan?" That's in Korea. <laughs> so we were there. Uh, what was your specialty? My specialty, I was in the combat engineer, and I was a special weapons. What person. special weapon? So, along with being just a plain old foot soldier like everybody else. But, and the engineers are no longer engineers when you get into combat. They're, uh, that's just a secondary uh, assignment. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. When there's no war and you're not shooting, well, then you're out either building a bridge or doing uh, road repair or whatever, but uh, basically you're just good old infantry. Mm -hmm. When did you leave for Korea? Uh, had to be in August because some or first part of September because we got there foot in September and I got captured the first day of December. So you went through Japan and arrived in Busan? No, I went direct to Directly to Busan? Directly to Busan, yeah. How was Busan when you arrived? Oh, it was sort of a turmoil. Uh, they had people all over. I guess the second day out, we were uh, seeing wounded and getting shot at uh, occasionally. And uh, from there on, the further we north we left, well, the more shooting we got into. But it was uh, sort of a turmoil. Everybody was trying to get out, and people were trying to get in. and. So tell me about how you were captured and when you captured. Uh, well, we were on the <coughs> Kunari, the Battle of Kunari, and uh, the, our battalion was supposed to hold the line while the, the division r fell back and regrouped. And uh, they seen that they were going to get overrun. And uh, they just said, well, everybody get out of here the best way you can and uh, try to make your way south like the sunshine or somewhere. And uh, so everybody just went in there which way they could go. And uh, I was with four or five stragglers and we picked up some stragglers and next thing we knew we run into a command post of Chinese of, of a couple hundred. And uh, so we had an officer with us that could. When was it? Well, this was uh, first day of like of December there when we got captured. And uh, he could parlay either Chinese or Japanese or whatever. And they informed him that uh, they weren't going to kill us, that they, they wanted prisoners. And if you did something, you know, I mean, if you killed one of them or something, well, then naturally <laughs> you might get shot. But otherwise, uh, they just wanted prisoners. Mm -hmm. So they just rounded us all up. And we sat on a hilltop all all night long while they were gathering and questioning and shaking people down and the next thing we know we got up and we started on the road marches mm -hmm. so moving north so. how how did chinese treat you on the day that they they arrest you well, the, well relatively uh, pretty decent i mean uh, most of them were combat uh, orientated already they'd been shot at and they knew what it was all about Mm -hmm. And uh, I think some of them wanted to go home just as bad as <laughs> we didn't want to get captured, you know. And uh, but 
further north we got it, they changed guards or anything. Then they got a little cocky because they thought they ruled the world, you know. They got <laughs> what were you thinking when you were captured? I wondered what was going to happen, naturally, uh, uh, what they were going to do with us, and we, because nobody knew what was going to happen or where we were going. Uh, they just started marching us and moving us, and uh, where were we going, nobody knew, you know. So it was curious, you know, sort of scared as to what was going to happen. But it, uh, what did you say to yourself, why am I here? Did you say <laughs> that? No, that, that, no, nothing like that ever entered my mind. I just, uh, you know, I knew why I was there, and I knew we'd gone the wrong way or whatever. But uh, there's nothing you could do about it. I figured uh, we'd all either get liberated or or something would happen. We, you just have to take it from day to day and see what was going on. What do they feed you? Well, the best I can remember is whole kernel corn. <laughs> corn? Corn, yeah. How many times a day? Uh, well, let's see. Basically, normally it was like once, and that was at night when you moved off for the road marches at night. Uh, they'd load you up with whatever you could eat. And uh, most of the time when you were in the villages during the daytime, they kept you off the road and uh, they didn't do too much for you. And they wouldn't let you out of the huts that were in the housing, you know, because they didn't want you running around. They're afraid that somebody might see you from the air. Ah. So they didn't give you anything to eat during the day? Uh, I Once in a while, they, they'd come around with it, some chow, you know, it, corn or, or some millet, at, at, you know, at around noon or whatever. But they, Not uh, much. It wasn't a, a regular routine thing. I mean, you... <laughs> You may get some today, then you might not get some tomorrow, you know. And it was very cold. It was, yeah, it was, it was good and cold, real cold. Where did you sleep then? During, during the night, you didn't sleep because you marched. Right. Where did you sleep then? Well, they would, like, pick a, uh, a village or something. I guess they run the people out because you would stay in, in their houses or huts. And they just cram everybody into a room, uh, you know, a small room. Uh, uh, they jam in eight, nine, ten, twelve guys in a room, and and they would just disperse everybody through the little villages like that. It's hmm. the only place you could sleep, you know. How was your clothes? Was it ready it, for the winter? Just no, no, just what I had on when I got captured, and I was fortunate. I had a, a pair of uh, o OD pants with a shell. And I had a field jacket with a liner and a pile hat, which was 90% more than a lot of guys had. Uh -huh. A lot of guys had uh, just the raw fatigues themselves. And there they stayed there three or four days, and they buried a lot of people at, at both these places. Uh, lost bit, wounded, sick. And they just they, they buried them there. Then you had a big pit out there, and they just put them in the pit, and then they cover them up or whatever. We just moved on and on and continued. Some, well, I guess about 20-some nights, I guess, we marched. You know, at nighttime, sun down to sun up. Uh -huh. And next thing I knew, we entered this er area with all the houses and everything, which was, at that time, it was Choctong uh, is where we were at. And that's uh, where I stayed. I was only a corporal, so they didn't uh, kick me out with the sergeants or anything. So I stayed in Camp 5, which was there was actually, I was told later, and I knew later, that it was a base camp. Cause, uh, yeah. So, but I stayed there the whole time. So. From when did you arrive at Pyokton Camp? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know when it was. Was it 1951 or 50? Oh, no, 50. 50? Yeah. So must be end of December around 1950, oh, right? Yeah, it was all, all the winter time there. Tell me about your life. Th oh, there was no no prescribed routine. They'd get you up in the morning, and they'd have a roll call and call you out on the on the parade field there and check you out. They'd move around, use any kind of help at all. That uh, they put you on a burial detail or or a wood detail to go out and you know get bring in the wood. And and like in 51, when the, the boats would come in, the, the river was thawed. Uh, they'd have rations if for them. 
uh, you'd haul her all up to their kitchen and this, you know, this type thing. But uh, basically, it was uh, wood detail or something like that, or mm -hmm. burial detail the first uh, year and a half, anyway. Uh. And uh, there was no, they'd have a lecture, they'd run you off to lectures. and Indoctrination? And yeah. And Brainwash? Yeah, so watch this. He tried to. You know, a lot of some of them, I guess, believe what they were telling you know. But really? Oh, yeah. There's 21 of them I know were uh, believed it enough or were scared enough uh, for what they had said and done that they went to China. You know, they, they, would, they didn't come home. So 21 went to China? Oh, yeah. There was what, oh. 21 of them. And then one of them even died over there. Four or five years later, some of them came home, and some of them had wives when they come home. They brought wives with them, you know. Of course, good old Uncle Sam <laughs> let them come home, you know. But uh, tell me about the life there. How many were in in a room? Oh, I don't know. You take this room right here. Uh, I don't know if it would be divided. You know how right. the, the houses were. They had. And then you'd have maybe ten guys in each half, you know. So it was it was pretty well cramped. When you laid down, you were you were just you were pretty close, you know. If everybody laid on your side, you know. But, uh, no blanket. Not fifty in nineteen fifty. No fifty one. They they had uh, a real light tight blanket. And I think in the lat latter part of fifty. 51, first part of 52, they, they came out with a padded clothing for you, uh, one uniform, and then the summer uniform. But uh, until then, you just wore whatever you had. You try to, in your own body, try to snuggle up or do something. Hmm. So. What about food? So they had the uh, maize or high gear, uh, millet, whatever, and they had. Uh, and they, once in a while they'd have steamed biscuits, they'd make some those steamed biscuits. And of course, there's none of this happened until the, the peace talks got good, you know. If the peace talks were good, uh, you got a little better food or you got a little more. When uh, the, the Americans walked away from the table and the peace talks quit, <laughs> the food quit. <laughs> How many times a day, the meal? So they go, uh, let's see, I, if I can remember right anyway, they had, uh, uh, I think, Twice, I think it was a late morning and then you know evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they'd have somebody. Uh, normally, somebody would from the hut would would go up and get it and bring it down, you know. And everybody had their own little bowl and you help yourself or whatever. So they, if you knew anybody and it was in the kitchen cooking up there, you. You might get some of the crust out of the pot, which was real good. You, if you had more, you'd eat more, but you didn't have it, so you didn't worry about it, really. So, Did you uh, really <laughs> wanted to eat at the time? I always had a sweet tooth, and you know, I sort of always craved the cream puff, you know, American cream puff. And, and when I come home, I got some. And as soon as I ate one, I got sicker than a dog, too. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you anyway. haven't eaten that a long time, right? No. Did did Chinese hit you or tortured you? Myself, no. I not myself, no. I have heard about uh, people getting uh, tortured, not really tortured, but uh, beat on, I guess, or whatever. You know, uh, they try to force everybody to, you know, sign uh, letters and all this kind of. Thing. But if you didn't sign them, they they threaten you, you know, and then they. Harp and brainwash you and tell you you did this and you did that. And we're not going to give you this. And, but uh, for myself, and, uh, I was never beat on or anything like that. No. What What did you do, all of you together, your room members? Okay, and what did you talk? What was? Did you complain? Did you regret? What What no, was the they, topic? They didn't. Uh, Really nothing. I mean, uh, you just sit around and you. Some guy talked about home and whatever, and, uh, and basically that was it. There was uh, n no news. I mean, so you couldn't talk about the news. Uh, you know, you always often wondered uh, what was going on, but you, you didn't know. People were more or less reserved and, and, and 
stayed with themselves, you know, they didn't you know, get, you know, a lot of yakking. There's nothing to yak about, you know, so whatever. Yeah. How did Chinese indoctrination work? What did they so about say about the America? What did they say about oh, the American you know, soldiers? We, we were cannon fodder, and, and they were, uh, were the imperialists, and uh, uh, we, they said that we believed in, in segregation, and of course, in camp, they segregated everybody themselves, so <laughs> 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 they had the blacks in one, the Turks in one, and, and th within the camp, so they did <laughs> the segregation, but they preached about the Americans, so we were cannon fodder and all that. Uh, we were duped, and uh, they were going to take us to the promised land and all that kind of crap, <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't uh, Oh crap! Mo most guys just let it go in one ear and right out the other. Uh -huh. You know, in fact, a lot of guys you learn how to sit up and and sleep. You know, <laughs> you didn't even have to nod your head. You could sit there stiff as a board and be sound asleep. And you, so it's uh, it's just a board, you know. Hmm. Did you regret? Why am I here? What the on earth, what the hell is going to be happening to my life? Why am I here, the country that, did you know anything well, about Korea before? No, uh, uh, and you know, and, and, and to me, I, I never, I never uh, give that a, a, a thought because uh, I, I was an enlistee, I was an RA, and uh, my Uncle Sam sent me there, that, that was my duty, whatever it was for, I mean, the government knew what they were doing, and who was I to question why? Uh, I didn't even give it a thought as to why was I there. I just, I'm a good GI. I obeyed the orders. They say, you go, you go. So. What do you think about China now? About China? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I uh, <laughs> really, there's, I, I know they, they, they own about 90 90 percent of <laughs> the u.s <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we owe them everything i guess they keep borrowing and giving and trading but uh, you know uh, uh, get the politics and things i i don't even listen to them on tv or the radio so in reality i i could uh, well like care less you know they don't uh, i figure whatever the v is going to be and, and that's it uh, they can say what they want to. Talk don't change nothing. So uh, that's about the sum of that. You know. mm. Were you able to write letter back to your family? Oh yeah, I uh, when I, I I never wrote any letters, and, and I only received one letter, and that was from my aunt. And the only reason I got it was because uh, she was uh, a good uh, a bullshit artist. Uh, she said that uh, they were having Thanksgiving and they had rotten turkey and they had everything. She just degraded everything. And, of course, they liked that. So <laughs> that was good propaganda. You know, they thought, that, well, look at the, the Americans. Uh, uh, they don't have nothing, you know. They, they're starving to death and all this. And that's the way my aunt wrote the letter. <laughs> and it, Why? It, it, it came through. They were no problem. She wrote that letter intentionally oh, yeah. to you make know, it go through. Yeah, so you know, I would get the letter. So, and that way, <laughs> she wrote that, you know, that so they were, it, they had nothing but turkey to eat, and it made everything sound like they were in the poorhouse. <laughs> and that letter comes through, and you know, no, no problems, you know. Oh, but that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> But she, she was, uh, she wrote one letter like that, you know, that came through. And uh, that's the only one I ever got. I never got none from my folks. They, I don't even know if they tried writing. I doubt that they did. Because my dad was a, a very staunch uh, old army man. And, and he didn't, uh, he didn't believe in that crap. He, you know, whatever was there, that's it, you know, he said. Any, how many died? Did you see many dying? Oh, a lot of them died. I don't know how many in numbers, many though. Every day uh, uh, in 50 and up in through 51, there's eight, nine, ten burial details a day. You could, you could, you could always go on a burial detail. I mean, they <laughs> dead people there. Yeah, there was a lot, a lot of them died. Why? 
Well, through the, they were a lot of them were sick to start with, a new maltrition. A lot of them gave up, uh, just flat gave up. Uh, you could buy uh, some GIs had uh, they traded off with the guards or whatever, and they had some sugar and, as an example. And when they come around with the millet or something, oh, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. You know, so they got here, put a little sugar on it. Well, that tastes pretty good. You know, and now, and now. These guys, they say, well, okay. Now, if you want sugar, you gotta buy it. So you gotta, you gotta pay me for it. So, mm. and, well, I don't have no money. Well, then you don't get no sugar, you know. So now they're back to thinking, well, I, I can't eat that stuff, you know. Mentally, it, they just gave up a lot, and a lot of them, you know. And a lot of them, I guess, they just had wounds. Uh, they had a so-called dispensary or hospital or whatever top the hill. Uh, a lot of them were there, in and out, and uh, I never went to, but, uh, so I don't know what kind of treatment they really got, if it got any, but uh, I think most of them were just, uh, they got down, they got like pneumonia, they got sick, you know, and there was no, no facilities to take care of them, I don't know, so they just, just died. Anybody suicide? No, not that I know, no. Mm -hmm. Could have, I don't know, but I don't know. Tell me, what was the most difficult thing during the camp? Mm, most difficult? <laughs> I don't. I really don't know. Uh, any anything was outstanding as to being difficult, uh, you know, from one from another. I don't know. When did you know that you're going to be relieved? Well, we had heard about the little switch, and they shipped people out, and then they said, well, uh, we're, we're going to get to go out now, you know, because they had the little switch. And what do you mean by little switch? Well, they shipped out the wounded and the sick, and they were supposed to be in the hospitals and everything. And then along with them, a lot of the progressive-minded turkeys that uh, had written articles, and uh, they I think they shipped them out so they wouldn't get... Uh, killed before they got out because a lot of guys would, would have done them in before if they went back with the regular group. When did the little switch happen first? Oh, I can't even remember. Do you know when? I don't know. Huh? In April. 1953? I, yeah. Yeah. And we, and we came home then in the in, uh, uh, last part of August first because I got off the boat in I come home on a hospital boat, and I got off in San Francisco on, on Labor Day weekend, September the 5th. Okay, so it was a couple of weeks, so it was mid-August when, when we come home. So. What was on your mind when you know that you are going to be released? Well, I, I, I was pretty, pretty, pretty glad about that, you know. Uh, I really... Uh, didn't give it too much uh, thought of enthusiasm and everything until uh, I got on the boat, and then I then I knew I was going home. But uh, until then, the train ride and truck ride <laughs> down to Pamanjan to the Freedom Village, oh, well, anything could happen. Anything can happen. <laughs> when did you cross the Pamanjan? Do you remember? Well, August? I don't remember the day or whatever. In fact, I was in a, in a meat wagon. Uh, or an ambulance thing, and I went in uh, by vehicle. I didn't walk across like a lot of guys did. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I stepped out of the ambulance, I was I was there in Freedom in the village. You know, I was there. You know. And they run us through a delousing tent, and, and they were they can they went to ask questions if you knew anybody that was uh, a bad guy and all this. And if you did, give them their name. And <coughs> then after that, they said, well, okay, you go here and you go there. I went over in this line, and the next thing I knew, I was on a helicopter, and I went on the hospital ship. So I don't know why. I, I, I felt healthy. I may not have been, but <laughs> they, they sent me home on a hospital ship. How do they treat you, the Americans in the south of Freedom House? They did. They knew you couldn't eat nothing, hardly, because, you know, it was, everything would be too rich for you. You would just get sick. So they, they sort of cooled it. You know, they try to give you, they give you a, a semi-physical, uh, check your lungs and whatever, and if you had any wounds or anything, 
you know, physically. And uh, then they, I don't know how they treated the guy that went by a troop ship or how, how long they retained him or anything, I don't know. But they put us like on the on a hospital ship. We flew out on a helicopter, and when we landed on the ship, they told us uh, anything uh, you, you want to eat, uh, go tell the cook. Uh, anytime, you just go tell him, and he'll fix it. If you can eat it, fine. You know, and uh, they gave us a lot of eggnog and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so, as far as eating. Where was the hospital ship? You took the helicopter from Panmunjom, yeah, right? And yeah. then you landed in hospital ship, right? Yeah. Where? I guess it was in, I, well, I don't even know what it was. Down Busan, I guess. I don't know. Busan? Yes. I Have you been back to Korea? Mm -hmm. Have you been back to Korea? Oh, yeah. yeah. I spent a tour in 1960. I went back for a tour. One oh, you did? Yeah. And then my wife and I, we went over in 2003 on a on one of those visiting tours. We visit Korea, right? Yeah. Where did you Where did you serve in 1960? I was in uh, uh, Wijambu, right out of Camp K above Camp Casey. You didn't hesitate to go back. Huh? You were not hesitant to go back to Korea. No, it didn't bother me. They They said, "Hey, you said you're going on orders to go to Korea." They, my guys used to say, "Hey, you don't have to go. You were there before, you know." And I say, "Hey." Orders are orders. I don't. They're not shooting over there now. There's no war over there. I would just go, you know. So I went, no problem. When did you come back from there? In sixty, what sixty one, I guess it was. What was your rank and what was your mission? Well, I was in the engineers again, mm. and uh, I was a staff sergeant then, and I got promoted in. In Germany, when uh, we came back, and I was in the States a while, then went to Germany, and I was promoted to an E-7, and then uh, we come back to the States, and I retired. So you been to Korea in early phase of the Korean War, and then you went back to Korea 60, mm -hmm. and then you went back to 2003. Mm -hmm. You have a very clear picture of how Korea was back in 1950. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 60 mm -hmm. and 2003. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Oh, big difference. Uh, you can't even find a mud hut. <laughs> it went, you know, like during the war over everybody oxen and, and, and mud huts and people walking along with A frames packing all this stuff. And then when we went back in, in uh, 60, 61, uh, duty was wise. It, 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 was, it was good. You didn't do a whole lot of running around because they still. Had bed check and everything going, you know that was okay, and uh, you didn't get to see a lot of the the the, uh, the country. I mean, you were no tourist, and you did your d field duty and whatever. And then my wife and I went to uh, through Seoul and everywhere, and we went up to Camp Casey, and uh, it, the roads are all paved. They got modern stores, and and it, everything is good. Uh, you know, it's it's really nice. And the people are, are extraordinarily uh, thankful. They're the only people I can honestly say that are thankful for what the Americans have done. You know that because you were in Germany too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was in France and I was in Germany. Didn't Both. French and Germans? Uh, didn't they didn't just didn't spit on you and look at you. The Korean people are the only people, even today, uh, uh, like in Reno, where I live, uh, they, every year the uh, Korean church uh, puts on a, a, a dinner and a, and a program for all Korean veterans. And uh, they have a full layout, American food, uh, the Korean food, and, and they treat you like kings. And uh, they're just thankful. And, uh, and they appreciate it. And, they, and they, they tell you and they show. What is Korea to you now? Well, it, it, it's just uh, Korea to me is, is just a country that, that's come a long way from nowhere, and uh, they're just good people. I mean, it's just another country, but I mean, as far as uh, that's it, I guess, you know. To you personally? Well, it's, I, I don't know how, how you would explain it. Okay. I don't know. How did your experience 
in the Korean War affect your life? Well, for a long, uh, well, I don't, I don't think it did anything in my life that changed anything. Uh, I have a, I had more respect for, for Korean people. Uh, you know, before, uh, like the, at the end of the Second War, uh, the, the Japanese and everything, everybody, Orientals, period. But, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that changed when, when, uh, when I went to Korea and I come home and everything. So I, I have more respect for them than I would the, the Vietnamese or, or, or the Japanese even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, Oriental people as a whole, I have more respect for now than I had <laughs> prior to all that. So, mm. so. But, uh. Wow, thank you very much. And I pay respect to your endurance, patience, and bravery. And I want to thank you on behalf of Korean Nation that what you did for Korea. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.